the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's precious metals news. It's Friday, April 13th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Well, it was another week of push and tug for gold. The price of the yellow metal is about even this morning. Currently, gold is trading at 1341. Silver is at 1668, and the silver gold ratio is 80.61. There's been some selling pressure over the last couple of days with an uptick in investor risk appetite. We've also seen this in the late week rally in world stock markets. Gold was up early in the week significantly as tensions mounted over war in Syria. That spurred some very strong safe haven demand. Gold climbed as much as 1.75% to 1369.40 an ounce on Wednesday. That was its highest level since August 5, 2016. But gold booked its first loss in five sessions yesterday, pulling back from Wednesday's highs as minutes from the U.S. Federal Reserve's March meeting peaked expectations for more interest rate hikes this year. It appears the central bank has laid the groundwork for another rate hike in June. That would leave it six months to implement the third that's already been forecast, and also leave some wiggle room for a possible fourth hike if the central bank thinks the data warrants it. Basically, other than some jitters about a trade war, or maybe even a real war, the mainstream is still clinging to this notion that everything is great. Of course, you can say everything is great all you want, and I guess everything is great until it isn't. Pundits and politicians keep trying to talk up the economy. They might be able to keep the optimism running high for a while, but at some point, expectations will run headfirst into economic reality. In his podcast this week, Peter Schiff argued that very few people are ready for the long-term pain that's ahead. That's because the mainstream is mostly ignoring the warning signs. And believe me, there are plenty of warning signs out there. There were a couple in the news this week. For starters, defaults by retail companies rated by Moody's hit an all-time high in Q1. There were a total of nine defaults among Moody's rated retail corporates. According to Wolf Street, total corporate defaults in Q1 were up 22% from last year, and the nine retailer defaults accounted for nearly one-third of them. As Wall Street put it, these are not mom-and-pop stores. These are retailers large enough to be rated by Moody's, corporations that make up the core of the brick-and-mortar meltdown. Retail companies that defaulted during the first quarter included Sears Holdings, Claire's, and Bonton stores. And the second quarter didn't start off a whole lot better. Last week, nine West Holdings declared bankruptcy with $1.6 billion in loans. The company owns a number of well-known brands, including Nine West, Anne Klein, Gloria Vanderbilt, and Bandolino. Fitch ratings trailing 12-month institutional loan default rate of retailers rose to 8.6%, with $5.9 billion in loans now in default. Fitch paints a pretty gloomy picture. The firm anticipates more large retail chains to file bankruptcy this year. 10% of the retailers in Fitch's market index are listed on Fitch's top loans of concern list, indicating a material default risk. These retail chains include Neiman Marcus Group, Sears Holdings, Full Beauty Brands, David's Bridles, Tom Shoes, Indra Holdings, Everest Holdings, Things Remembered, and NY DJ Apparel. Most people blame a shift to online shopping for the brick-and-mortar retail struggles, and sure, that's certainly a factor. But we can't just blame Amazon for the retail meltdown. The bigger story here is corporate debt. The story behind the Toys R Us bankruptcy that I've talked about on this podcast before give us a glimpse at the fundamental problems eroding the strength of the U.S. economy. Easy money created by Federal Reserve Monetary Policy. The ability to borrow a lot of money at low interest rates fuels borrowing and speculation. Malinvestment distorts the economy and inflates bubbles that eventually pop. Over the last 20 years, the Fed has inflated and maintained a giant retail bubble. There's another big problem for the retail sector, a problem even Amazon won't be able to escape. Americans are broke. Household debt has surged to record levels. Americans have maxed out their credit cards. In other words, the struggles in the retail sector reveals deep cracks in the overall economy. We are over-leveraged and interest rates are going up. This does not bode well for the future. So everything's not great. There are also signs that the subprime auto bubble has burst. 
Bloomberg recently reported that not only are subprime auto lenders facing tough business conditions, there are also allegations of fraud and underreporting of losses. This is from the Bloomberg report. Growing numbers of small subprime auto lenders are closing or shutting down after loan losses and slim margins spur bank and private equity owners to cut off funding. Summit Financial Corp., a plantation Florida-based subprime car finance company, filed for bankruptcy late last month after lenders, including Bank of America, said it had misreported losses from soured loans. And a creditor to Spring Tree Lending, an Atlanta-based subprime auto lender, filed to force the company into bankruptcy last week after a separate group of investors accused the company of fraud. Private equity-backed Pelican Auto Finance, which specializes in deep subprime borrowers, finished winding down last month after seeing its profit margins shrink. We've seen this song and dance before, right? As Bloomberg noted, the pain among auto finance lenders parallels with the subprime mortgage crisis last decade when the demise of small finance companies like Own It Mortgage and Sebring Capital Partners foreshadowed that bigger losses for the financial system were coming. So we see a common denominator here, rising interest rates. Easy money pumped up both the housing and the auto loan bubble. When the Fed takes away the punch bowl, bubbles burst. Chris Gillick works as an analyst for Colonnade Advisors, focusing on subprime auto investments. His description of the auto loan industry sounds a lot like mortgage lending back in the years leading up to the housing bust. He said, quote, there's been a lot of generosity and not a lot of discretion on part of lenders and investors. There's going to be more capitulation, end quote. Auto loans to subprime borrowers have hit delinquency rates not seen since 2010. The number of borrowers behind on payments has been increasing steadily since 2012. In the third quarter of 2017, nearly 10% of auto loans extended to consumers with credit scores of less than 620 were 90 days or more behind. The bottom line is average Americans are getting priced out of the auto market. As a result, we've seen increasing numbers of subprime loans as the auto industry tries to keep the bubble inflated. If the subprime auto loan market implodes, how in the world are people going to buy cars? This is not a good sign for the automobile sector. Zero Hedge summed it all up. Quote, cheap credit leads to easy lending conditions and record prices as everyone floods into the market with lenders hardly discriminating who they give money to. End quote. And then the bubble pops. The collapse of the subprime auto industry probably won't have the same impact on the economy as the housing crash did in 2008. The industry isn't as big in terms of dollars, but what's going on in the auto industry is indicative of broader trends in the U.S. economy, and I would say the same thing of the retail sector. As we've noted over and over again, these are not the only bubbles. In other news, global silver mine supply dropped for the second straight year as industrial demand rose for the first time since 2013, according to the World Silver Survey to 2018, just released by the Silver Institute. Industrial demand for silver rose 4% to 599 million ounces last year. Solar panel fabrication primarily drove this growth. Photovoltaic demand climbed 19% as solar panel installations worldwide rose 24%. Brazing alloy and solder silver fabrication also increased, rising about 4%. Even with the healthy increase in industrial consumption, overall demand for silver fell slightly in 2017 due to weakness in the investment sector. Total demand fell about 2.3%. But the drop in supply was steeper than the fall in demand. Global silver mine production fell 4.1% in 2017. It was the second straight year of declining mine output. Silver scrap supply also dropped, falling to 138 million ounces. It was the sixth straight year of declining silver scrap supply. Many analysts think silver is set for a breakout. The silver-gold ratio remains historically high. This means silver is undervalued compared to gold. Currently, the silver-gold ratio stands over 80 to 1. This means you can buy 80 ounces of silver with 1 ounce of gold. Compare that with the historic average ratio, which hovers around 16 to 1. The modern average over the last century is around 40 to 1. As Peter Schiff said in a video last year, this is silver on sale. If you want to learn more about the current state of the silver market, as well as what's going on with the gold market, talk to a Schiff Gold precious metal specialist today. Just call 1-888-GOLD-160. 
Well, that's a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more, and keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week at shiftgold.com slash news. If you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap podcast over at iTunes for free. There's a link on our show notes page. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week.